Welcome to the next Droplet. In this segment, we're going to talk about different methods of inventorying and detailed inventorying of the primary or the bankful channel of a watercourse. In a previous segment, we discussed and we illustrated some of the techniques that we could actually be using to actually acquire data in the field that was delineating primarily the upland regions, which would be high terraces or low terraces, the floodplain itself, and we could actually be using technologies such as a differential RTK GPS system, a total station for example, we could be supplementing that with LiDAR data uh, or digital elevation models or topographic data and the focus on that was to survey the attributes and primarily any changes in slope uh, within the landform or any other features that were actually on the landscape that would be relevant to a hydraulic analysis. We also use that as an opportunity <coughs> to identify any major changes in roughness that would be occurring within the cross-sectional uh, envelope of the channel itself. Now we made a note in that is that uh, particularly when it's associated with farmers fields those roughnesses will change seasonally and temporally based upon different crop rotations. But if there's features that are identified that you believe are going to remain consistent over time we want to identify those different regions so that we can also integrate those into some type of a calculation for the upland roughness components. Here what we want to focus on is some of the more detailed measurements within the bankful channel. To, to do an overall hydraulic analysis, it's commonly done is that we typically will measure the top of the bank, the bottom of the bank, maybe a half a dozen uh, locations within the primary or the bankful channel itself. And then we want to get those other features that are from a, a raster data set or from LIDAR or from a GPS survey for the upland regions. But there are some focuses and, uh, and interests where we want to actually do more detailed investigations within the primary channel itself. And those are often when we want to do a rapid assessment of what's happening with the bankful channel or we actually want to do some type of a, a long-term monitoring inventory, whether that's to understand the characteristics about erosion and deposition within a given uh, channel based upon what's happening uh, upstream or downstream, or we might have actually constructed uh, through a river rehabilitation or a restoration project, uh, a, a project, and now we want to do some post-construction monitoring. So we want to uh, inventory and evaluate the performance, in other words, the quasi-stability of that channel over a longer period of time. So what we're going to do in this session is identify some of the different techniques that are available to us to inventory the primary channel itself. And the ones that we're going to focus on is an RTK differential GPS an optical uh, level, a automatic optical level with barcoding reading technology, a graduated weighting rod, and also then a broomstick. Because not always do we have all the technology that we need out in the field, but quite often that we can actually readily make something where it, if we're collecting and being careful about our data acquisition, that we can actually come up and identify uh, a reasonable estimate of what some of these parameters are with some relatively simple tools. Let's go to the field and talk about some of these. So here we are at the field. And we're first going to demonstrate the RTK differential GPS system, where the technician is measuring the top of one bank, and he's sequentially going to define the characteristics of the top of the bank, the bank full stage, the bottom of the bank. And then he's going to proceed across the channel on what he perceives are equal intervals to measure the variations in the channel cross section and also picking up any notable changes within the bed slope that he can either visually detect and or feel within it by waiting. It is of note, however, that in most of these GPS systems, the tips are the points that we actually uh, have. We've removed the, the sharp tip points and actually put on a blunt nose tip. Reason being is a sharp nose tip can protrude an additional 10 to 15 centimeters into the bed of the channel, which then introduces an immediate bias within our vertical surveying accuracy that we have in, in, introduced an additional error of, of uh, measurement uncertainty. And he's simply going to go to the other side of the channel. Now, one of the challenges within this technique is if you're in humid or semi-humid regions, the ability to actually acquire a GPS lock for the first order accuracy of one centimeter vertically becomes rate limiting, particularly in the spring time or in the summertime months. So usually we'll limit these analysis to either the early spring or late fall after the deciduous vegetation has dropped. Otherwise, we would typically use a total station survey equipment that we're not going to talk about in this droplet, but we'll save that for another one 
and the techniques that are associated with that. Here what we're going to show is for the remainder of the, the techniques, we're either going to extend a tape measure across the channel and we're setting the tape measure of what we believe or what the technician believes is the height of bankful stage. And if you recall, the height of bankful stage is just at the limit of when the water starts to enter into the floodplain. Now in semi-humid or humid regions, the vegetation can grow down into the banks of the channel. So it doesn't have as much of a delineating uh, break point within using vegetation as an indicator as to where the, the uh, vegetation can um, uh, identify the presence of bankful discharge. So in another drop, we'll be discussing some of the other bankful indicators. But for here, it's a readily and easily identifiable floodplain on the river left side. And of course, river left is in the frame of reference looking downstream. Here, the technician is ensuring the fact of the tape measure is taut. In other words, not sagging across the cross section at that given elevation, because we want to actually use that in some of the sequential uh, demonstrations to actually use that as our frame of reference of measurement. Here he's just verifying the fact that the tape is taut and we can proceed with our evaluation. The method here that we're going to demonstrate is a typical automatic optical level, where we're first going to back sight some known given location here we've actually inserted by pounding into the ground a four foot long, one inch square standard, what's referred to as a standard iron bar or a metal bar that's providing us with a geodetic control location with respect to uh, always a known benchmark that we actually had previously measured uh, using a differential GPS um, in a survey. Here the technician is simply going along the cross section and the operator is now identifying through the optical level what the values are in the stadium. And remember everything is in reference to the instrument height or the, the reference to the optical plane of the level itself. So from the benchmark, everything has to be referenced through a back sight to this common uh, elevation datum. And similar to what the technician was doing before, it's just going along, but now rather than interpreting what he thinks are equal intervals, he's following the tape measure and actually measuring at exactly one meter intervals across the width of the channel. This provides some consistency so that if one is actually using this technique in erosion monitoring, you're always measuring the same locations such that you decrease uh, variable error based upon uh, general or variable locations of sampling. And if you notice that he's uh, measuring this and he's looking down at the tape measure that's being identified in the video, and he's just proceeding across the stream. And also, if the technician identifies any other notable changes in, in slope and or uh, deepest parts of the channel or various other features, those also those points are being acquired within the cross-sectional survey. And he's just finishing off by measuring the top of the bank on the river right-hand side of the channel. And we also have a benchmark on the right-hand side of the channel. We typically will want to put two benchmarks on both sides in case one is eroded out through a high flood event we at least will typically will have one benchmark remaining so that we can still reference the same cross section. Here we're actually doing the same technique again, but instead we're actually using an optical, uh, automatic optical river with barcode code reading technology. And the barcode steady rod itself is similar to a standard steady rod, but now it just looks like a barcode that the optical uh, level can read. The benefit of this technique is now that it removes error from the uh, the leveling operator because they can't read actually what the stadia values are. So the information goes directly into a data logger. So it's actually removing some of the data transcription errors and also interpretations based upon what the operator is reading off the stadia rod. Similarly to the previous method, the technician is measuring at equal one meter intervals across the channel and at other locations of interest breaks and slope or the Thalwig location. So he's referencing the tape measure as he's going across the stream channel. Here, with every location that's being measured, the data is being entered into the data logger, but also the distance that's being called out by the technician that's holding the steady rod is being entered into the data logger as well. So we not only have an elevation or stadia elevation, but we also have a distance. So this becomes a readily uh, easy data set to transcribe post field surveys. Similar to the previous method, still everything is in reference to the horizontal instrument height of the, you now the optical barcode reading level.
Now what we're going to turn to is again the tape measure that's extended across the same cross section, but rather than actually using an automated level, here we're actually going to be using a graduated weighting rod, which is simply similar to a cane or a ski pole where there's actually consistent graduations that are identified in five centimeter intervals along the, the length of the pole. Then what's actually being measured is the tape measure itself is now being held at the, the bankful stage. It's assumed to be level. And we're measuring from the bed of the stream channel up to the height of the tape measure itself. This is why it's important to keep the tape measure taut. And then simply identifying on the tape measure every e equal and even meter and any other breaks and slope, what the height from the bed of the stream is read right off of the weighting rod to the tape measure itself. So we are measuring all the values below the height of the tape measure, and we're assuming that that is going to then be coincident with where the bank full stage is. So this gives us not as accurate as a measurement of the geometry of the channel, but relatively close measure. Finally, we're going to do a similar method, but rather than a, a graduated weighting rod, we're actually going to use the handle off of a broomstick. And we're going to identify, and we're going to disassemble the broomstick, put some duct tape over top of it, and then all we're simply going to do is wait across the channel, and now we don't have a tape measure to use. What's been strung across the tape channel is simply a piece of, uh, of string. So we're actually going to use the length of the broomstick, but we're going to measure over on equal intervals of the length of the broomstick. We're then going to place the broomstick vertical. So measuring over the length of the broomstick to the next location, at that location, we're going to measure up to, from the bed of the stream channel, up to the height of the string, and we're simply going to, with a sharpie, identify what the length or what the height of that elevation is on the broomstick itself. And then we're going to proceed across the channel at intervals that are going to be consistent with the length of the broomstick, which we can readily measure when we're out, out of the field, and proceed to mark off ticks on the broomstick itself of the height of the channel of each given location. And we're going to proceed across the channel and do that at each location. We're then going to, when we're out in the field, also identify on the river left and the right hand bank the, where the edge of the water is or the edge of the bankful channel. And that's simply done by at the bankful stage or the location on the river left tying a single loop knot within the string itself, and then we can get to the river right location of where we think that location is. We're going to tie two uh, simple little level loop knots within the string itself. So we can simply remove the string when we have completed our analysis, take the string and our broomstick back to the office or the field camp and do the analysis. So here we are back in the office, back in the field camp, or back at home. We have our data that's been collected from, uh, at least here what we're going to show is the stadium method and the broomstick method so that we can actually compare them. So what we want to do is focus in on, on the spreadsheet and uh, remind ourselves of actually how we break down this data to actually come up with the cross-section profile. So here what we've collected then is, for the stadium method, we'll go through that first, is we have the cross-section chainage, and that's simply the distances starting at the left bank uh, of the channel over here. We can refer to this as the left bank. And we go over here to the right bank of the channel, or at least within the right bank region. And we have then identified, based upon the field inventories in here, um, what the chainage was. So this is going from the left bank to the right bank, what the distances are, the intervals where the tape measure was strung across the, the cross section, where the, the surveyor stopped and measured the vertical distance on the stadia rod using the, the level. So those are each of the intervals. These are the stadia readings that the operator actually at the level had recorded based upon the observations through the level itself. So we can use that information then to break down what the cross-sectional geometry is. The other part that's uh, very important in here is we have some benchmark that we have to reference. And if you recall that we did a back site or ref uh, uh, referred back to some elevation first that was known. In this case, it was uh, an elevation on a on a standard iron bar or what's referred to as a sib, which is simply a, a, a one inch square iron bar that has been either um, 
using a sledgehammer or jackhammer driven into the ground and provides us with a long-term monitoring location of a stable location with respect to setting an elevation on the top of that pin. So we refer to that elevation. Uh, we have surveyed that previously with a GPS, so we actually have the known coordinates of that given location. And also, at least for the sake of this example here, we have the known elevation of 220.50 meters. So the first thing that we have to do is from, and recall that our, our optical level is not at the elevation of the benchmark, which is 220.5 meters. It's at some height of the operator height with they're seeing through some uh, elevation above that. So everything is going to be relative to the plane of that survey level. So we have to uh, then calculate what that plane of that survey level is, which is simply going to be a value of the benchmark plus the value of the stadia uh, height above that was read from that optical plane uh, holding, the, holding the rod on the benchmark itself. That, that is the value that's actually then of the plane of the uh, optical plane. So this is the, what we refer to as the instrument height. So all other data is going to be then read relative to that elevation. So now I have some various descriptions in here. BS was for my back sight condition. Bankful is identification of what we uh, believe in the field was the bankful stage or the bankful elevation. Remember that uh, from a, uh, a compound channel perspective, that is the elevation where we, we interpret that the water is just starting to escape out and escapes onto the floodplain or the relatively flat, consistent area beyond the, the, the banks, which could be vertical or they could be on an inclined plane, where that water you foresee it actually reaching out into the floodplain region. One of the uh, demarcations of that location is typically you will also see a change in the vegetation from an exposed bank onto a uh, grassland uh, channel or uh, a vegetated bank elevation. Now that differs depending upon the region that you're in. If you're in the semi-humid or humid regions within um, the eastern part of North America versus more westerly regions, vegetation has a way of migrating into the, uh, in, down further into the stream channel. So it's not always a reliable indicator, but it is one that we actually use. And, and it'll be in another drop of where we're discussing some of those different identification techniques. Then we have other indicators or, or denotations in here. TB is simply the top of the bank where we uh, identify maybe there's a break in the slope. BB is the bottom of bank slash EW, which is the ed edge of water. We have GSs, which are simply ground shots, and these are uh, points all the way across the channel. We identify the Thalweg, which is, in other words, it's the deepest point in the channel itself. It's the German word for deepest point in valley. Uh, and then we just go, go away, uh, throughout the rest of the cross section, identifying any unique features in those given locations. So now let's actually calculate what the uh, elevations are for this given cross section. So all we're going to do then is take relative to our instrument height, whatever the stadia reading was at any given location. And what I'm going to constrain this to is I'm going to constrain this that we're always using the instrument height. If I had changed my instrument location, I would then have to do another what's referred to as a foresight and a backsight location to then have a new instrument height at a different location. Here we set it up at one spot so everything is relative to that one instrument height plane in here. So then we have the elevation uh, at our bankful stage, and I'm simply going to then prop it, uh, propagate that through the rest of the field, and that, that is now giving us our uh, elevations along that cross section. So what I'm going to plot then is I'm going to plot the change, my horizontal distance, typically because we're always referring to uh, the channel cross sections in a downstream d direction, zero is on the left bank, uh, and, and we have increasing numbers towards the right bank over here. The right bank was identified at, for a bankful of a value of 20 meters relative to the bankful uh, location on the, the uh, left side of the uh, channel, and then, we're, then we have the elevation. So I'm simply going to plot column A in here versus column E in here. But before the, I do that, I want to actually then see how close my broomstick analysis was to, to the, 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 um, the uh, characteristics that were determined from the stadium method. So here what I have is 
all of the, the, the marks that I've indicated on the broomstick, and remember all I did was I spanned a, just a piece of string across the channel of what I believed bankful was, tried to level that as best as I could from one side to the other. I could put actually a line level on that if I wanted to, to, to see if that improves things. And uh, again, I tied a single knot onto my uh, uh, left side of my channel to indicate where that location was. And on the right side of the channel, I tied two knots. Uh, or just loop knots. So what that gave me is the fact of when I came back from the field I could then just measure the, the distance between my single loop knot and my double loop knot to give me my total distance and the total distance in here was a value of 19.5 meters. 95 meters. So then what I did was, and remember on my broomstick, all I had was a piece of duct tape taped to it, and all I would do is go across the string channel, and I would use the length of the broomstick starting at my left bankful location, noting the height of that elevation at the bottom of the bank, and then I went one width of my broomstick to my next location, uh, just held my finger on the string channel or uh, hovered it above the string channel itself, put the broomstick in place, marked actually on the duct tape itself the, low, the height of what the string was, and then I picked up the broomstick and then it proceeded to actually go to the next distance along from the broomstick from one side to the other. And the broomstick is slightly longer than one meter, which resulted in the fact that I had a uh, few in, fewer in number of observations. So relative to if I was going uh, every equal uh, even meter as I did, and then picking up any no notable locations and slope. So I had a few extra numbers uh, doing it in cross-sectional form this way versus in my broomstick method over here. But all I'm going to do is, if you notice then, that uh, there's no distances associated with uh, the measurements on the broomstick, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that my bankful channel or my channel in here is a rectangle, so all I have to do in here is just take the average of the, these values. So that's the average of these values. I'm going to divide it by 100 to get it into meters. And that gives me a value in here of 0.69 meters. So all I'm going to do then to identify my uh, channel in here is I'm going to assume that my change or my distance on my left bank is the same. So I'm going to start at zero over here. And I'm also going to start at the same uh, elevation as bank full is over here. So that I'm comparing apples with apples with respect to what my elevations are. So I'm going to assign this value over here to the same value here. I'm then going to, so that's the top of my uh, rectangle, rectangle cross section. Now I just want to vertically get to the, to the bottom of that cross section. So again, I'm still at a change of zero, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract my average flow, or my average uh, flow depth based upon my observations. Then all I'm going to do is go across my entire width of my channel, which was 19.95 meters. And I'm then going to take the same average because I'm just assuming it's a horizontal line in here. So again, I'm going to take my elevation and subtract my average. And so that's going to be at the bottom of the bank now on the right hand side of the channel. And then I'm just going to use the same reference datum for the bank fold on the right hand side. So now let's plot that information and actually see how close the relationships are. So here in the results, we can identify that, well, the, uh, we have a rectangular shape for the broomstick method and we have a, a, a lot more of a, a better defined shape for the, the stadium method. So clearly the stadium method is providing us a lot more definition of, of cross-sectional characteristics of the channel. But let's also look at actually what the, the results are for parameters that we're typically of interest in, such as the cross-sectional flow area, the weather perimeter, and the hydraulic radius. So the broomstick method gives us a cross-sectional area of 14.09 meters squared, a weighted perimeter of 20.407 meters, and a resulting hydraulic radius of around 0.69. Whereas the, the stadium method gives us a cross-sectional area of 13.8 meters squared, which is actually reasonably close to what we came up with the broomstick method, 
a weather perimeter of 21.38 meters and we would expect the weather perimeter to be a little longer because it's going to actually pick up the undulations that are below that average depth and also account for the side slopes a little bit better than just a rectangular channel resulting in a hydraulic radius of uh, 0.645 meters. So it's not as accurate as a stadium method or a GPS method or any of the other techniques, but it's actually giving us a reasonable result, particularly as far as cross-sectional area goes. Uh, if we need to do something quickly or rapidly out in the field or if we're limited on tools, it gives us a technique. Thanks for coming to the field with us.